democracies across the world have evolved over time. As a relatively young democracy, India has much to celebrate. But mere freedoms and the right to vote do not guarantee success. We must constantly introspect and engage in dialogue on issues that matter. Our democracy is a work in progress. The theme of the conference this year is money, power in politics. There are three essential drivers of expenditure in politics. Legitimate campaign expenditure, costs of party maintenance, and illegitimate vote buying. While it is easy to blame politicians, we must recognize that they are compelled by the system to spend enormous sums of money to sustain political activity. At this conference, we take a deeper look at the drivers of expenditure and deliberate on systemic reforms needed to make our democracy work better. Legitimate political activity costs money. Running campaigns, advertising and public mobilization are expensive. Currently, election expenditure ceiling of a candidate is 28 lakhs in major states for an assembly constituency and 70 lakhs for a Lok Sabha seat. Note that this ceiling applies only to candidates and not parties. Despite this, according to reliable estimates, in the 2019 Lok Sabha elections, nearly 100 crore has been spent per constituency on an average. The law provides for full tax exemption to individuals and corporates on all contributions to political parties. This is a strong incentive for open contributions to parties. However, in 2017, the government introduced electoral bonds. These bonds give scope for quid pro quo, but decisions may be influenced by political contributions without public scrutiny. The 2003 law also provided for free airtime on electronic media to recognize parties, but this part of the law has not been implemented so far. Additionally, the widespread practice of paid news is distorting perceptions apart from promoting unaccounted spend. Regulations on social media should be put in place to curb hate speech and fragmentation. Real expenditure in politics is not on legitimate election campaigns. Let's take a look at party maintenance. Parties in India bear enormous burden of organization building. A party that cannot engage the political workers at the grassroots level cannot be viable for long. With the failure of basic government services, people started relying on cadres to act as the interface between the citizen and the bureaucracy. In a typical assembly constituency, an average of 200 to 1000 party workers are available to people round the year. Most of them are relatively poor. They invest their time and energy for their intermediation, which they recover through commissions, patronage, contracts, and so on. Remember, most of it is indirect cost. Wealthy party activists may spend out of pocket and recover it through business opportunities offered by political networks. But in most cases, the costs are recovered through a vicious cycle of corruption, patronage networks, and abuse of power. As a result, governance is always suboptimal and people pay a heavy, often invisible price for political activity. These direct and indirect costs at even 15,000 to 20,000 rupees per worker per month would amount to 3 to 4 crores per year per assembly constituency for each major party. The parties are helpless too because in the absence of accountability and service delivery, they are expected to step in to redress at least some of the grievances. Therefore, blaming them will take us nowhere. We need to make the government work efficiently in the delivery of basic services and enforce accountability of lower bureaucracy. This will liberate parties from this burden and allow them to do their main work of political participation and mobilization. The most alarming driver of expenditure in politics is vote buying. In many large states, a serious candidate of a major party typically spends about 5 to 20 crores for vote buying in an assembly constituency. About 1000 to 2000 rupees being paid to voters is not uncommon. When two or three major candidates spend money on that scale, 
only one can win and the others lose. But not spending vast money eliminates the candidate from the race itself. Therefore, vote buying is not about winning. It is an entrance fee where non-expenditure almost certainly guarantees defeat. Vote buying will not disappear by pious pronouncements. The long-term solution is only when a voter realizes that his or her vote is linked to tangible public goods in a manner that they can feel and experience on a daily basis. This is possible only in an empowered, effective and accountable local government. This decentralization is vital, but it takes at least three to four election cycles for people to value the vote and for vote buying to come down by this route. We need to do something more to quickly reduce vote buying. First, to understand the incentives for buying votes, let's take a look at our electoral system. A party requires a majority in the parliament or assembly to form government or acquire influence. Every seat becomes critical in the numbers game. Parties are therefore desperate to win in every constituency by all means, fair or foul. This creates an incentive for parties to resort to vote buying. Now assume that the head of government were elected directly at the state level. This raises the cost of vote buying disproportionately in an all or none election. Parties would then focus on the leader's credibility, record and agenda to garner widespread support rather than focus on winning every constituency. However, direct election at national level may pose problems of regional representation in a vast plural society. The answer lies in designing a system that makes it necessary to carry many states across the country for national political power not merely a few large states in one region. Second, our constitution adopted a Westminster form of government where the executive power is derived from the legislative majority. The key prize in our elections is executive power. As the legislator's loyalty is key to power, he exercises real and enormous influence over executive power in the constituency in transfers, contracts, police cases, and many acts of patronage. It is this finger in the executive pie that makes legislative office very attractive in a poor country with dysfunctional governance. Clear separation of powers takes away the influence of legislators on executive and reduces the incentive for candidates to buy votes. It will also improve efficiency by allowing induction of the best talent from society into the cabinet. It will eliminate day-to-day -day interference in administration and local governments will become strong as they will no longer be stifled by powerful legislators who now see them as threat and competition. Our first-past-the-post system means that there is only one winner for the party and candidates in a constituency and that is a no-holds-barred competition for every vote. Competitive vote buying is inevitable in our conditions. We need to alter incentives for the parties and candidates. A system like proportional representation creates a value for every vote. Parties will get seats in proportion to the votes they get in the state. Therefore, the party's desperation to buy the vote will decline. However, PR may increase the tendency for political fragmentation. This can be curbed by a reasonable threshold of vote share requirement in a state to be eligible for representation. PR may also create hung legislatures and make it difficult to form majority governments. This can be addressed by giving bonus seats to the leading party. Whatever be its origin and evolution, Today, candidates and parties are trapped in a vicious cycle. In a winner-take-all system, victory is critical for recouping the costs incurred and to sustain the party machine. Therefore, parties increasingly look for wealthy candidates who can spend vast sums to buy the vote and project an aura of victory in the state so that party workers' morale is high and voters take the party seriously. Many independent studies estimate that in a five-year period, the expenditure incurred is of the order of 100,000 crores for all elections, national, state and local. 
In addition, the direct and indirect cost of party maintenance accounts for another 100,000 crores in five years. For a poor country, this sum of 40,000 crores per year is very large. That much of it is an unnecessary burden on parties or that most election spend is illegitimate should be causes of grave concern. The answers are conceptually simple. Campaign finance needs should be met legitimately and transparently. Service delivery should be improved and accountability should be enforced without putting enormous burden on political parties. Finally, systemic reforms such as direct election of the executive with clear separation of powers reduce the incentives for vote buying. Whatever our preferences are, status quo is not an option. In this day and age of rapid global change, we cannot afford to wait for decades and centuries for our democracy to improve. We need to act thoughtfully, responsibly and with urgency. We can have three approaches. First, the cynical approach of blaming politicians and parties, complaining about a decline in moral values and do nothing. Second, the thoughtful observer's approach of understanding the challenges, causes, consequences and best practices. Third, the responsible reformer's approach to identify best practices, analyze what works best in our situation, generate informed debate, build consensus and accelerate real change to alter incentives and outcomes. This conference aims to combine the approaches of the thoughtful observer and the responsible reformer. We need to stop blaming politicians and parties for all that is wrong with our politics and governance. They are as much victims of a vicious cycle as they are part of a dysfunctional system. What we need is a practical, sensible, thoughtful approach to make our democracy work better and to make every citizen and voter understand the stakes and consequences of their choices. Let us all discuss, challenge, question and participate. This is only one step. We need to continue our efforts collectively to be a part of the change we need to see.